Next up on our agenda, we have Dr. Ben Gertzel. Among his many honors, he is the Vice Chairman of Humanity Plus, an advisor to both Singularity University and the Singularity Institute, the CTO of Genesient Corp, and an external research professor at Xiamen University in China. Um, I've also heard him been called by more than one person in, in the artificial intelligence community the uh, badass of the artificial intelligence research community. That's a pretty dubious honor if I do say so myself. I don't know what that actually says about Ben Gertzel, but please welcome him to the stage, Dr. Ben Gertzel. Ah, so somehow I've graduated from being a, a pencil neck geek to being a badass. I, I, guess, I, I guess that's a good thing. So, so yeah, as, uh, as he said, I, I've worked largely in AI. I have a startup company, Novamente LLC, and also another startup company, Biomind LLC, focused on applying AI to bioinformatics with a special focus on applying AI to help understand how to extend human life. And that, that, that's what, what I'm going to focus on here. And this is largely work I've done in collaboration with Genescient Corporation. So I, I want to start off with a proposition that most people in this room will probably be agreeable to. The human body can be effectively understood as a very complex machine. And I'm not going to say the human body is a machine. I mean, as, as, as Bill Clinton taught us all, the word is is, is complicated. This, was, this is one of my most favorite Clinton quotes. Is there a sexual relationship between you and Monica Lewinsky? Well, that depends on what the meaning of the word is is. You know? And I, I, I don't know what the meaning of the word is is, and I don't want to discuss it now. But looking at the human body as a machine has proved very useful. Molecular biology has brought us a long way. But it's a very complicated machine. The human mind struggles to understand this machine. And one of my hypotheses arrived at through a lot of work applying machine learning and other narrow AI tools to biological data. One of my hypotheses is that with the help of AI, we can understand this complex machine better and do more to improve human health and increase human health span. So to see why I think this is true, Let's start by looking at some of the challenges that face biology right now. The basic challenge facing biology is that biological systems are really complex. And we have brains, we have immune systems, which are also complex adaptive systems. The liver, which is a complex three-dimensional pattern recognition system. There's a lot of complex genomic, proteomic, metabolomic networks all through the body. There's a lot going on on a lot of different levels. We have amazing new instrumentation for measuring all the stuff that's going on. This produces amazingly large amounts of data, which we have trouble analyzing. Because the human brain, what did it evolve for? I mean, the human brain evolved for gathering food, for hunting and killing, for finding mates. The human brain did not evolve for analyzing molecular biology data and brain imaging data and so forth. So we're, we're poorly suited to analyze the amazing volumes of data that our very sophisticated instrumentation is, is gathering about, about the human body. And this complexity of biological systems has implications for the pharmaceutical industry. Drug development is very costly. I mean, depending on who you ask, the total cost of development per drug is about a billion dollars, which is part of the reason why drugs are so expensive. The cost of drugs is, is it bakes in the cost of research to, to develop new drugs. And most of the current drug development methods look to find a drug, a small molecule, that will act on, on a single target, say a single protein. But given the complexity of biological networks, that doesn't always work well. There, there, there's not that many complex, not that many diseases that really can be impacted by affecting a, a single target. You'd have to act on a number of targets together, which brings you a complex systems problem. 
looking at longevity research in particular, there are similar problems ensuing from the complexity of biological networks. I mean, we have some interesting mechanisms that at first glance seem like, well, maybe this is the key to why we get old and die. I mean, there's the well-known Hayflick limit discovered many decades ago that there's a, a limit to how many times a cell population will, will divide. Then there's, there's the problem of DNA repair. So when, when the part of the DNA that, that mediates DNA repair itself gets damaged, you can have a kind of recursive cascade of, of damage. And th there's many other specific phenomena underlying aging, but when you look at it in detail, each of these specific phenomena accounts for a very small percentage of what actually goes wrong as, as we get older. And you have approaches like Aubrey de Grey's uh, SENS approach, which is focused on, dam focused on damage repair. Kind of see all the things that go wrong with the body as it gets older and fix those specific things. And this is a really interesting approach, and we may be able to get something out of it. Since Aubrey didn't show up here, now, now, now he can't argue back with me, unfortunately. But one problem that a lot of biologists to whom I respect find with Aubrey's approach is that it, it may not adequately respect the complexity in the underlying biological network so that it may be harder to repair this damage than he thinks since we don't really understand how the damage happens and how the different ways of trying to repair the damage may impact the other biological networks. As an example, one of Aubrey's research focuses is to, to move mitochondrial DNA into the nucleus, where they will be protected from, from damage. And that's true. If you could move mitochondrial DNA into the nucleus, they'd be protected from damage. On the other hand, what the mitochondrial DNA do may be enhanced by all sorts of proteomic networks outside of, of the nucleus. So when you move them in there, they may not do everything they're supposed to. Now, of course, moving them in there may be cool. We may learn a lot of, of things from it. But because we don't know how the, all these networks work, it's very hard to say that that's really going to have the, the impact you want, which, which isn't to say that's a bad direction of research. It's just to say it's hard to be complicated. It's hard to be confident of it when you don't understand the underlying systems. Now, another theory of why aging happens, different than the Hayflick limit and DNA repair damage and so forth, which is another old theory, which is fairly well supported by some of the concrete work I'm going to describe in the, in the rest of my talk. An another theory is what's called uh, antagonistic pleiotropy. And w what this genetics term means is that we have some adaptations in our body that adapt us to live well as 10-year-olds. We have other adaptations that adapt us to live well as 20-year-olds. We have other adaptations that adapt us to live well as 30-year-olds, and so on. By the time you're like 50, you have adaptations for life at many different ages, all piled on top of each other. But the problem is, each gene does many different things. So you have genes that are adapted to do many different things, optimized to help you at different phases in, in your development. And these kind of, these different purposes of the genes all get bollocked up with each other and cause all, all sorts of complex problems. Now, when you're like 80 or 90, things actually clear up in a sense, because we're, we're, there's no significant adaptations in our genome to help us be healthy at 80 or 90. And the result of that is that the death rate levels up. It plateaus as you get older. And this is borne out by experiments in fruit flies and a bunch of other animals. That the death rate, the chance of dying in a given year, increases over time. But then when, once you're really old, you enter what biologists call late life, and the annual death rate flat, flattens out. Unfortunately, it's very high. But it, <laughs> but it, it, does, it, it, does, it does flatten out. Right? So if, if aging is largely due to antagonistic pleiotropy, as a bunch of data suggests, that would suggest that the problem of aging is really a problem spanning many, many different biological networks. And basically, the genetic networks underlying aging are the genetic networks underlying life. And that, that doesn't mean you can't do some good by fixing damage, but it means that there, there's kind of f fundamental issues there that... Uh, May, may make fixing the damage harder than it, than it seems at first. So, some of the work I've been doing, which is going to be the, the main focus of this talk, is in collaboration with a company called Genescient, which is based in Irvine, California, which was founded by Michael Rose, 
from the University of, of California at Irvine. And what these guys have that's really interesting is a line of fruit flies, of Drosophila melanogaster, which live now almost five times as long as, as regular fruit flies. So they live months instead of weeks. And these flies were not produced by genetic engineering. These flies were produced by experimental evolution. So they bred long-lived flies with each other over and over again for 30-odd years until we get a line of very long-lived flies. And now we're studying the genetics of these long-lived flies and using AI tools to do it to try to understand why they live so long. Of course, you could do the same experiment with people. It would just take tens of thousands, say 50, 100,000 years. So if, if some cavemen had started selectively breeding people for longevity, by now we could have Methuselah people. But un un unfortunately, they, they did not have the foresight to do that. I mean, <laughs> e even if, if the Chinese had started doing it when they started their empire like 5,000 years ago, we could have decent results. But un un unfortunately, it, w it, wasn't, it wasn't done. And the idea of Genesian as a company is to use the data gathered from these long-lived flies to help discover drugs to remedy age-associated diseases. Because these, if you can look at the genetic networks underlying the longevity of the flies, figure out which substances hit the key points in those networks, try those substances on flies, then mice, then people, it's a more systematic approach to drug discovery than most of what's done in, in the pharmaceutical industry now because the long-lived flies live a long time because of these complex interconnected networks. So it kind of lets you bypass the single drug, single target approach. And th th these are actually not just long-lived flies. I like to think of them as, as super flies. And I, because they, not only do they live a long time, I mean, they, they get laid more often. They're, they're better athletes. They, they survive various stresses there. Like you can electrically shock them and they're more likely to, to live through it. You can infect them and they're more likely not to die of the infections. Their immune systems are better. So, hmm, did I do that? No, dude. Th these are uh, exceptionally good flies. Uh, th this graph is just from one of the many experiments showing uh, that they have extremely strong hearts. So, basically, the, the x-axis is the age of the fly in weeks. The y-axis is the percent who die of heart failure. The solid line is normal flies. And the, or the, the dark line is normal flies, the light line is a long-lived fly. So what, what this shows is throughout their life, fewer of them die of heart failure when you, when you electrically shock them. And I know it's, it's not very nice to the flies, but I, I don't like fruit flies much anyway. So, <laughs> so before I became involved with Genesian, they did a bunch of work applying traditional statistical methods to analyze gene expression data from the long-lived flies. So the gene expression data, basically, crudely speaking, it, it measures how much work each gene is doing at a certain point of time in the fly. The, the gene is linked to the production of RNA, which is then producing proteins. So if you look at the genes that are expressed differently in the long-lived flies from the normal flies, there's many, many genes there that tend to be mutated in people with certain human diseases. And we can look, we have diabetes, arthritis, hypertension, heart disease, Crohn's disease. So many genes that have known SNPs in humans corresponding to these diseases are also very differently expressed in the long-lived flies. And so th those corresponding genes are then promising drug targets for drugs to try out in flies, mice, and, and people. So one of the other findings from traditional statistics is there, there's a lot of genes that are expressed differently, that are doing different things in long-lived flies from normal flies. So there's like 12 or 1,300 genes with a statistically significant difference in expression level. And over 800 of those have human orthologs. So the genes are basically the same in humans and flies. And they're very different in the super flies from the regular flies. So it doesn't seem to be the case there's like three genes and you like flake the switch and oh boy, the fly lives a long time. It's, it's really a thoroughgoing change and these, these genes span many dozens of, of different biological pathways which, which intersect in, in complex ways. So there, there's a lot of interlocking adaptations that have happened to make these flies live a long time which, which is what you would expect. On the other hand, it's not the most cheerful conclusion. It'd be better if there was like, well, 
okay, this gene's just got to be suppressed and you live a long time. We'll do RNA interference on this gene and then we'll all be immortal. But it, it seems more complex than that. Like if, if you did the experiment for 50,000 years of making Methuselah people who live a thousand years or whatever through selective breeding, you probably found those people have differences in almost every body system which complexly interrelate with each other so that tweaking one of us to be like one of the Methuselah people, it, it'd be hard. You'd, you'd have to fix a lot of different things all over the body in a, in, in a coordinated way, which is probably doable. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm, I'm just trying to look objectively at what, what the nature of the problem seems to be. So traditional statistics did a lot of good in analyzing the Methuselah fly data, and now I'm going to try to convey a bit of what we got by applying AI tools to the, to the same data. So how can you gain greater insight into the complex biological data sets and complex biological systems? So my, my contention is that applying AI tools can, can help. And this is why I founded the company Biomind back in, uh, in, in 2002. And we, we've, we've done a lot of interesting work in Biomind applying AI to biological data about various diseases. So to, together with the CDC, back in maybe 2004 or 2005, we came up with the first evidence for genetic basis underlying chronic fatigue syndrome. And working with Davis Parker and Rafal Smigrodsky at the University of Virginia, we found a close to 100% accurate diagnostic for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease based on heteroplasmic mutations in mitochondrial DNA. So that Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, of course, are aging-related diseases, which has some relevance to the current talk. But this, for those who are AI geeks, this is mostly what you call narrow AI technology. It's machine learning. It's, it's pattern recognition technology. It's not uh, human-level thinking machines. It's basically sophisticated data analysis. And we've open sourced some of this stuff in a library called Open Biomind, which is a Java toolkit of machine learning tools specialized for analysis of biological data. You can, you can find that online. And, you know, usually when I give talks at these uh, futurist conferences, such as the previous Singularity Summits, my talks are about my primary research direction, which is trying to make thinking machines that are way smarter than, than human beings and can launch a positive singularity. More in the vein of what Ray was talking about at the end of his talk just now, but with less focus on brain simulation and more on computer science algorithms. And eventually, I think that's how biology is going to be solved. Like artificial biologists, AGI scientists, will put the human biologists out of business. But until we have those artificial biologists, I think our best bet is to use machine learning and other narrow AI tools to help the human mind analyze the, analyze the biological data. And there, there's a lot of aspects of it. The aspect I'm focusing on in this talk is analyzing of quantitative data, such as SNP data and gene expression data using machine learning tools. Another angle, which is also important, and I won't touch on much here, is text mining. I mean, AI tools can extract information from research abstracts and research papers online and that they can build graphs. Like, this is a pathway diagram. You can't read it well, I guess, but it's extracted using a tool from uh, Ariadne Genomics, which is a genetics company based in Maryland, near where I live, which I don't have anything to do with. But they've, they've scanned all the PubMed abstracts, and they've extracted information about relationships between biological entities into a big database that pharmaceutical companies can buy. So that's, that's another part of what narrow AI tools can do to help bio, bioinformatics. So what if we discovered using narrow AI, open biomind, machine learning technology to analyze the gene expression data from long-lived flies? Well, one thing that we did is kind of winnow down the thousands of differentiated genes to, to a few dozen key genes that seem most powerful in differentiating the long-lived flies from the, from the regular flies. So, I wouldn't exactly call these like master control genes. I think they're a little weaker than that. I mean, an analogy you could use is, I don't think these genes are like the fascist dictators of longevity. They're, they're more like the congressmen and, and business executives longe of longevity or something. Like if you, if you have a fascist dictatorship and you want to change it, if you get control of the dictator, you're kind of done, right? 
If you have a democratic capitalist society, you want to change it. If you get control of the business guys and the congressmen, you can do something, but it's going to have very complex effects, and you really have to understand the whole system to know what you're doing. So I think it's more like that. There's many complex actors, there's many feedback loops at multiple levels, but we can isolate a subset of genes that seem to have more importance than, than the others at distinguishing long-lived flies from ordinary flies. And we can then look at hubs of the longevity network, see wh which regulators seem most important. So you can focus in more on which, which genetic differences are most critical. And then you can link that in with drug databases and with databases of uh, nutraceuticals and other substances generally recognized as safe and see, see which of these substances are most connected to the genes that are the key drivers of longevity. So the drugs we're looking at in Genetion are proprietary, but what, what I've done here is shown like the, the top 12 substances, which are free substances, that are most closely associated to the key control genes of longevity, according to long-lived flies. So these are the substances that have the most connections to the proteins that are produced by the genes that are most important in the Methuselah flies longevity. And I mean, there's a lot of familiar players here, like vitamin E, resveratrol. And I think that's actually, it's kind of good news, right? It means that, that A, the data isn't bullshit, and B, we're not totally on the wrong track with what pills we're taking already. But there, there's also, this probably isn't the list that you would necessarily make off the top of your head. So the, the prioritization is interesting. Now, this doesn't mean that you should go home and take a cocktail of these pills, of course. I mean, it, may, may, maybe you should, but we haven't, we haven't proved that. And things, of course, may act differently on flies than, than, on, than on people. But it, it's an illustration of the approach to drug discovery that we're taking is gather genetic data, use AI to figure out what are the key players underlying longevity based on the genetic data, then use existing databases to figure out which drugs, which substances, which, which molecules are going to be most interesting in potentially leading to therapies for extending life. And one thing we're doing right now, the results I've just described were about gene expression data. On the, right before I got on the plane to fly out here from Rockville, I got in my inbox the gene sequence data from the long-lived flies. So we now know what are the SNPs distinguishing the long-lived flies. And I haven't had time to crunch through that data with our AI tools yet, but one thing that's clear is there's a real, real, real lot of SNPs differentiating the long-lived flies from the ordinary flies. And I mean, there, we have multiple lines of long-lived flies, not just one, so that we can tell genetic drift from which, which of the SNPs are really due to longevity, so there, there's multiple independent lines for decades of long-lived flies. We can see which SNPs are there in every independently evolved line of long-lived flies. And there's, there's a real, real lot of genes with a real lot of SNPs. So it, the one thing I could say based on looking at the SNP data like last night and this morning is there, this gives evidence for the fact that there's very rich, complex networks of, of differences. And I haven't yet gone through to crunch through and see what are the like, key master genes based on the, on the SNP data. Hopefully they're the same as the ones that came out of the expression data, which will give us some added validation that, that we actually know what we're doing. So all this is interesting, and what I want to talk about in the last few minutes here is what I think is coming next. I mean, I think that using machine learning technology lets us narrow down 1,200 genes to a few dozen key genes and a few dozen key pathways, and I think that's important. But, you know, I'm acutely aware there's so much more meaning in this data than what we're able to dig out using, using the available tools. I mean, well, the, the best that we can do now is we're probably getting one-tenth or one-one-hundredth of the information in the data that, that we've gathered and is sitting on our hard drives. And I think if, if we had an AI system that combined the number crunching ability of our current machine learning and statistics algorithms with the sort of generic heuristic intelligence that humans have, then we'd be able to see a lot more in the data we have now. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily completely solve the problem, but it would uh, 
it would drive us there a lot faster. So I'll run through these last slides in just a few minutes because I won't have time for, for Q&A. Those of you who are familiar with my other work, you, you know that I'm a, I'm a big fan of the notion of artificial general intelligence as opposed to narrow AI. Narrow AI being task-specific problem-solving systems. AGI, or artificial general intelligence, being systems that can think in a general, broad way like human beings, transferring knowledge from one domain to another, solving problems that weren't even known at the time they were programmed. And I think both of these types of AI have a big relevance to biology and life extension. If you want to find out more about my AGI work, you go to opencog.org, and this describes my own approach to building thinking machines that will ultimately be smarter than people. It's an open source software project, and anyone can uh, contribute. Some things about my approach to AGI are in my book, The Hidden Pattern, which you can see on the table out there. Uh, my new book, which should probably come out beginning of next year, called Building Better Minds, is a technical book going through the details of my AGI approach. What we're doing with our OpenCog AGI system is controlling humanoid robots, which we're doing in Jiamen University in China, controlling virtual characters in virtual worlds, which I'm doing in my company, Novamente LLC. And ultimately, what I see happening in the next decade or two, maybe sooner if things go great, is combining this sort of OpenCog AGI stuff, which we're using to control robots and virtual game characters, Combining that with a narrow AI, we're now using to crunch biological data to get a, a proto-AGI system that does basically artificial biology. So I think we can, we can piece together early stage AGI with advanced machine learning and get an artificial biologist. And that's how I think we're going to crack the life extension problem because the, the biological networks are really rich and, and complex, and they, they, they strain the human mind. So my, my contention is one day artificial biologists will unravel the complex networks underlying human longevity and human health span, and they will figure out the coordinated genetic manipulations you need to abolish uh, involuntary death. So going back to where I started, I think the human body can be usefully thought of as a complex machine I think we have a hard time understanding this machine, and as AI systems get better and better, we'll do better and better. And finally, if, if you want to see a more detailed uh, textual rendition of the points I've made today, go to hplusmagazine.com. There's an article I posted there like three days ago, AI's Superflies and the Path to Immortality. And you can also see the various relevant websites I've shown there for Genescient, BioMind, Open BioMind, and OpenCog. So we have maybe six or seven minutes for questions now. Uh, have you been doing uh, experiments where you've got any sort of cocktails that you've been feeding to flies that are relatively, you know, wild-type flies yes. to try and... And how have those been coming along? I, I shouldn't say, but so, some of them are, are going well. But we, we haven't disclosed details. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned there not being any one solution to aging, um, no one cocktail for immortality. Uh, do you think it's possible that at some point we will reach a point where we can extend the human lifespan by one year every year, essentially getting you immortality because you don't need more than an extra year yeah, every year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... My own view is w once we more fully understand these networks, or once our AI systems help us more fully understand these networks, I think we will be able to perform the needed complex genetic manipulations. And I mean, I honestly, my, my gut feel is more like w once we really understand, once we've built an AI that can really understand what's going on, I think it'll be, more, it'll be more like we'll figure out how to extend life by five or 10 years rather than just one, one year per year. But wh whether we'll be able to creep forward incrementally based on a very limited understanding of the underlying processes, it's possible, but I'm less confident of that. But others involved with genetics may, may have a different view because this is all conjecture, right? Um, I'm wondering, how do you test this stuff that uh, it seems like, in humans at least, uh, this could be a 60-year experiment. And with That's why we're working on flies. I mean, you can give a pill to a fly and see if it lives longer. It doesn't take 60 years. Then you can try it on mice, which live a couple years. And then if it works on mice, 
and, and if it's verified to work on, on pathways that are conserved between mice and humans, the odds of it working on humans is, is, is pretty high. I mean, that, that's a standard pharmaceutical drug development methodology for, for other ailments. So. Hi, congratulations for your work with Genesis. I think it's outstanding. I work with Aubrey de Grey. I just wanted to make a comment about what you said about the move of the mitochondrial DNA to nu nucleus. It's actually the, probably the hardest and the most ambitious part of the science project. But it's also true that it's happening, I mean, it happened already to several dozen genes, human genes, all over the human, I mean, the biological realm. And it's actually happening in a lot of plants and angiosperms that are actually oh, still now moving some mitochondrial genes to the nucleus while still expressing the mitochondrial copy. So that can be done actually. And they use some RNA editing, like for example, happens in populus, some RNA editing to actually, uh, you know, shut down a little bit the expression of the mitochondrial part of that SDH4 gene. So, well, uh, it's probably interesting because it's still happening and a lot of in a lot of different animals and plants that really made our mitochondrial genes more, more you know, it protected. It might work. I mean, what, one, one comment I would make just is my intuition based on analyzing the data from these flies is that the, the list of problems that occur as you get older is very, very long. So even if you fix seven or ten problems, there may be a lot, a lot more problems, and it's not clear how much impact you're going to get, even if you do solve that, that one problem. Yeah, no, it's really complex, and uh, it's uh, really exciting to do all this. But anyway, we're still, I mean, we're working hard at Science Foundation to actually now use synthetic biology to degrade some junk that builds up inside cells with uh, uh, encouraging results uh, recently. So Cool. So, so that's encouraging results on the mitochondrial DNA project? Not, we're not working on that yet. Okay. We're just working on degrading some junk that builds up in several conditions. And, but anyway. I, d I didn't understand that, actually. Yeah, mm, we're, actually we use synthetic biology. We design and evolve some synthetic genes uh -huh. to degrade some junk that builds up inside the lysosomes. And and greetings, degrade. everyone. Please refrain from dialoguing with speakers. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Does that work in vivo? Uh, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, no, no, we're working. No, we're working in culture cells, absolutely. But we're starting preclinical tests on mice soon. Anyway, congratulations. Uh, one more question, Ben. Sure. Uh, so, what kind of lifespan do you get if you cross the superflies with normal flies? Because that would let you distinguish between whether you're getting uh, complex interdependent adaptations or a bunch of uh, individually useful adaptations. I, I don't know, actually. <laughs> and, maybe that, and maybe that Michael has done that experiment, but I, I, I don't know about it. But I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm almost sure it's going to give you, like, somewhere in between with the kind of normal distribution. But I mean, if it's halfway in between, then that probably means that uh, the individual mutations are useful by themselves, and you don't need, like, the, all of them. I, I, don't, I don't follow the reasoning, but I guess we could discuss it later. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Sorry, guys, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, Ben.